Warning. This work of fiction, intended for adults, contains strong language and graphic depictions of violence. Discretion advised. The Ballad of the Flower, Book One, Druid. Written and performed by Neil Lenson Meyer. Chapter 22. The table was warm underneath her fingertips. She could tell it was oak, like the long table in her tree. She felt the grain of it, felt how it was polished and worn with practice and use. She was lying down on a table, with straps of leather around her wrists and ankles. Her mouth was dry, and nothing happened when she tried to swallow. Her tongue was puffy, and she was afraid to open her eyes. She tried to reach into her mind, to meditate, to find release or sleep, but she knew it wouldn't work. There was a familiar clinking of mortar and pestle. Someone was mixing something. Tara strained her mind for any smells that could help her, but she only inhaled a few grains of sand and coughed hard, pulling the straps a bit as she did. "'Good morning, half-girl,' came the hag's voice. The clinking was coming from that direction, too. Tara counted to three and opened her eyes, seeing a poorly lit little shack. There were bones hanging from the ceiling, little decomposing wind chimes, and small cages of living ingredients. It almost looked like home, only twisted and darker. Tara could lift her head and saw a door while she was scanning the room. The hag hadn't moved from her spot in the corner, her back turned to Tara. Her arms and legs were still covered in scrapes and bruises, and when she struggled against the straps they rubbed her skin raw. She took deep breaths. Calm would get her out of this, not panic. She breathed in and out, her ribs aching as they expanded. The storm had beaten the shit out of her. Tara tried not to be anxious as the hag turned back towards her and the table. Her skin was papery and yellow, not like elven skin, but like a human that was made from melting wax. Tara got a good look at her face now, and one of her eyes wandered free of its companion, who was sharp and diligent. Tara could feel paste being spread on her arms and legs, and she was suddenly aware that she was completely naked. She tried to cover herself but the straps bit at her wrists and ankles. "'Don't struggle, girl,' the hag said. "'It's not worth it.' She was covering all of her cuts with the paste, and Tara noticed that the pain was being numbed, not healed. "'Ravnessa,' Tara said. Her voice was like sandpaper, and it hurt to speak. The hag sighed, but looked unimpressed. "'Yes, girl, it's me, the source of all your problems,' she said sarcastically. I'm going to kill you, Tara said. Saying it made her feel a bit better, more relaxed even. Oh, I'm sure you'll be just as successful as your mother. Ravnessa had finished covering Tara's exposed body with paste, and everything had faded away into a dull absence. It felt like she was floating. Where is she? Tara asked. She was lucid enough to be angry, and she wanted all of the answers she could before one of them died. She's dead, dear girl, Ravnessa told her. Tara saw her brandishing a thin knife. You'll see her soon enough. Tara expected to feel sad, knowing that her mother was really dead for once and for all. But either the numbness or lack of real connection to her kept the sadness away. Why? Tara asked. Her eyes refused her orders to look away as the long knife slid easily and painlessly into her thigh. She tried to kill me. Stupid thing to do, really. But I suppose the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Tara tried to shudder as Ravnessa peeled a layer of skin from her leg, but her body couldn't move, couldn't feel. She held the flesh up to a candle to examine it more closely. Shame, really. She was a brilliant student of mine. She held the piece of Tara delicately, like a fallen leaf. Bog, Tara said her voice swimming away from her. The numbness was trying to get into her mind, but she kept pushing it out. Ha! Ravnessa gave a laugh, but didn't smile. She smelled Tara's flesh with a curious look in her one good eye. She stole secrets from that idiot and brought powerful magic back to me. Tara wasn't sure who had been lying, or who had been lied to, or what was actually going on. 
although apparently she kept some secrets to herself. Ravnessa turned to Terra, and her face seemed to contort somewhere between a sneer and a curiosity. Marcolis, Terra tried to ask. Her voice felt far away. No, the ranger was not a secret. She wanted love, but I told her I needed a child to complete the spell. Ravnessa had set aside the piece of Terra and began to feel over her stomach, searching for another sample. Me, Terra said, remembering how her mother had seen her and refused to give her up to the hag. Yes, she offered you to me, Ravnessa said. No, Terra cried, actually managing to sound loud. Yes, girl, but I couldn't accept you. I needed a child. That didn't make any sense. She had been offered, but had been refused? What? Terra was so confused that she almost didn't care about the knife reaching into her lower abdomen. I couldn't accept you, Revnessa said again with exaggerated slowness, as if explaining to a toddler that fire was dangerous. You aren't a real child. Terra was drowning in confusion again. The numbness was growing stronger. Her brain wasn't obeying any of her commands. Not a real child? Pieces of her life that had been scattered by obsession and fog were starting to become clear in her mind. Half, she said suddenly. She was still grappling with the idea that her mother really had tried to give her up and had wanted to sacrifice her like a straw man on a pyre. She wasn't really a child. Finally, you understand, Ravnessa said. Terra saw parts being pulled out of her body. I still don't know how your idiot mother managed to do it, but somehow she made you. Ravnessa was running her hands along something that looked like part of Terra's reproductive system. Terra wasn't sure if she was being examined, dissected, or sterilized. Not a human, not really, yet very much alive, Ravnessa continued. Perhaps she even used her own flesh to create you, but you are hardly a suitable ingredient for such a complicated ritual. Terra let her head roll back on the table. Things were being pushed into place. Her mother hadn't had sex with Marcolis. She hadn't had sex with anyone. Terra was the result of an experiment. A spell. She was as natural as the lights from Barney's wand. And this hag was going to figure out how to make more of her. Terra thought of an army of half-girls, each identical to her, each with messy hair and green dresses, each being turned into hollow-eyed hags. Terra looked up at the ceiling, almost forgetting that she was being operated on, experimented on again, some strange homunculus to be poked and prodded. She was too dehydrated to cry, and she didn't even want to. The numbness had spread from her body and had begun to affect her very emotions. She wondered if for even a moment, for an instant of her existence, if her mother had loved her. Had anyone? Would Bog still love her if he knew the truth? Would her friends? Would Siri? She looked up, more out of curiosity than anything, and saw that a majority of her body had been cut open and taken apart. She recognized human organs. Is that what made her real? They were all in the right place. She thought about her utter neutrality as a shadow flashed past the window. Ravnessa was suddenly on high alert, putting the knife down and grabbing a few supplies. Terra didn't recognize them. She barely recognized the sound of a bow loosing arrows, a sharp twang that brought pictures of long hair and bright eyes into her mind. She couldn't move to look, but she heard a thud as something heavy hit the ground. Terra knew she would be dead soon, unless someone healed her. Someone talented, too, by the looks of her guts on her chest. She couldn't quite place the voice that was speaking. Her eyes were blurry, and the numbness was coming for her. She heard a few footsteps around her, and saw a glow around her body. As Nerevin leaned in, he caught her eyes moving. Terra went from numb to afraid. Her friends hadn't found her. The other task force had. Asset acquired, boss, Nerevin said. He slung his bow over his shoulder and eyed her like a gutted fish. Terra used every bit of energy she had left 
to look to her other side, where Mags had come into view. Good. Patch her up and put her out with the rest. Tara's eyes fell closed. The pain had woken her up. Whatever had been done to heal her had probably done more damage than Ravnessa, but the pain was sharp, and she was suddenly aware of the heat as well as the pain. It was bright, and there was sand. Tara thought she'd never be clean again. When she tested her arms and legs, they were tightly bound together, and she was on her stomach. She wanted to try and roll over to her side to get weight off of her injuries, but even as she looked up, Ratch's red-scaled hand slammed down on her and knocked her out. Tara could smell the ocean, salty and familiar. She thought of Adam and hoped that he would end up somewhere on the beach when they were all buried. She was still tied up, and the heat of the desert was gone, replaced by the humid air of the Darius Islands. She smelled gumbo and felt her stomach growl. The agony of the sensation forced her back into unconsciousness. She was sitting up, her hands tied behind her, her feet bound below. She was on some sort of bench. She couldn't see, and as she breathed in, she felt the covering on her face and head. Quiet, Treeborn. It was the faintest whisper, and Tara wanted to scream out to him, to tell him everything and see that he was okay. I can only talk when the guards are talking. Adam's voice came again. Tara couldn't hear anything, but she trusted Adam's ears. There was a creaking all around her, and in the darkness she could feel the sway of the ocean beneath them. Her wounds still hurt, and she was starving. There was silence for what seemed like hours. Time wasn't even real anymore. Barney, keep it down, Adam said from a distance. Barney was here too. Were they all here? Was Siri okay? Tara, stay calm, Adam whispered angrily at her, and she tried to slow down her breathing. Siri had to be here. What about Carson? Where the hell were they? Guard change, 60 seconds, Adam said. Status. Carson's voice was so close to her that Tara nearly screamed. I'm good, Adam said. Fine, Barney said next. I'm pretty beat up, Tara said. I'm okay. Siri was across from her. Tara tried to reach out her feet to touch Siri, but her chains rattled and kept her still. We only have two options, Carson said. Escape or die in the capital. Nobody spoke. Escape it is. Barney, can you get us out of here? They took everything, Barney said sadly. I've got nothing. Forty-five seconds, Adam whispered. He was close to a wall. Breaking out of the chains will make too much noise, Siri said. Tara, how hard are you? Carson asked next to her. I was being dissected, boss. I'm pretty hurt, Tara replied. We could use a storm, Carson said unapologetically. Tara thought of the lightning she had caught on the other boat. I can do that, but I'll need time. Thirty seconds, Adam said. Are we close to any land? Carson asked. It's impossible to say, Barney said. If we survive, even one of us, we kill all of them, Carson said. There was a sober silence. If it comes to drowning, Barney, I'm sorry, you'll probably go last. Fifteen seconds, Adam said. At the next guard change, we do it, okay? Tara could feel Carson leaning back on the wall. They each gave little sounds of approval. I love all of you, he said. None of them needed to say it back. Tara lost count of the seconds almost as soon as she tried to count them. She instead resigned herself to attempting one last meditation before she drowned. She had heard that drowning was the most painful way to die. She tried not to think about it. Meditations on death were not as strange to her as she might have guessed. She had been so close to dying not very long ago that it just seemed like a fluid continuation of her fears about it. It was certainly better to die with her friends, with people she loved, with her real family. She resigned herself to the idea of her own death and felt peace. Not happy or sad, not even numb, just at peace. She felt a cool autumn breeze in her mind, felt a welcoming hand on her shoulder, comforting her. Soon, child, the wind said to her thoughts. Tara could see all of it now. Her woods, her friends, her life, her death. She saw Siri. She saw Bog. She saw herself. She was so empty of thought 
that Adam's whisper of 60 seconds seemed to have to echo down a well into her mind. Ah, oh, she thought to herself, I must bring the storm in now that will kill all of us. She could hear the ship creaking ever so gently. She heard wind outside of the hull, sails flapping, and it brought a smile to her face. Images of the Cornelian and her first kiss and the view from the crow's nest. She felt a little spark on her nose, and it tickled more than it hurt. Just a passive reminder that she was still here, in this realm, for now. She let out a long breath and heard the boards around her moan and twist. Thirty seconds. She reached out in her mind, and as she thought of her friends, she heard thunder and shouts from above. She looked down at the ship they were in, such a small, insignificant thing. She tore down the mast as easily as batting away a stray hair. Ten seconds. She reached down to the ship itself. Her hands were bands of lightning as she grabbed hold of the little thing. All the little soldiers on board were screaming, looking up at her as she worked. There was a sound of thunder as the ship was ripped apart. End of chapter. End of The Ballad of the Flower. Book One, Druid. Written and performed by Neil Lensenmeyer.